any way that or have them uh, sign up on their own. Let's get started because it's perfect timing. Let's begin by recording this session. Welcome everybody. So excited to have everybody in class today. And as always, we have people who have been here before and new people. So thank you all for coming and joining us. Today's class is a really important discussion that we will have looking at slavery in America. And what we're going to do is look at back to this idea, this institution, and all of the, the pieces around it in the law and in society from the colonial period all the way through to the reconstruction time period, which is the end of the civil war. So we're looking at about 1865. We're gonna do all of that in 30 minutes. Um, my name is Curry Sautner. I'm the chief learning officer at the National Constitution Center. And I'll be keeping an eye on the chat as well as the Q and A. So we love questions. So feel free to pepper us with questions in those areas. And I'll keep asking questions to Tom as we go through and we can make this as live and interactive as possible. Tom Donnelly is one of our top scholars at the National Constitution Center, and he's our brain trust for today. So we get to pick his brain and go through these ideas and kind of learn together in this community. So Tom, you wanna to say hi to all the students? Hi everyone. So excited to get started, Tom. And you know, I wanted to lay out some big ideas that we have for this class. So number one, and we can kind of think about how we wanna to react to these questions. And so you can put in the chat if it's a yes or it's a no, or maybe, or I'm not sure. Always acceptable to be, I'm not sure. I, I sit there a lot or it's complicated. Um, question number one, slavery was embedded into America's fabric by the time of the ratification of the constitution in 1787. Do you think it's affected how long slavery lasted in America and how it ended in America with that bloody civil war. Second big question is the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments and it's slavery in America and they try to rebuild our nation on a stronger, more constitutional foundation of equality. Do you think that these amendments changed the constitution so much that you would think of this time period as a second founding? Like if we think of the constitutional time period as the first founding of American democracy, is this the second founding? So feel free to kind of ponder on those or answer in the chat. Number one, yes, no, maybe. Number two, yes, no, maybe. And we're kind of gonna walk through to kind of give you lots of stories to see if you can answer these for yourself or maybe even change your perspective. So Tom, when we think about slavery in America, we really have to think before the constitution and the colonies. So can you give us an understanding of what slavery was like in America in the, the 1600s, how it changes in America and how it, Kind of changes for the world by the way um, the new the new colonies establish it. Absolutely, Curry. So yeah, the slavery as an institution is obviously older than the Constitution, as you said. And so you know, slavery ends up being written into the law of the colonies really early. So it's in the 1660s in places like Virginia and the Carolinas where we have slave codes written into into the law there. So it's an institution that is a customary practice in the colonies, but it's also one that is actually written into the law itself. So in the 1700s, we then see in these slave codes, the institution of slavery itself transformed. And so it really moves, it, it moves and it becomes an institution that is inheritable. So it's a condition that is connected with race. So it's African-Americans who are being enslaved and it's a condition that is passed down from parent to child. So when you hear that, that, that phrase chattel slavery, chattel slavery, this is what we have in mind. This is, this is what we mean. We mean this idea that slavery is an institution and slavery is a condition written into the law that's passed down from parent to child. And in the United States, it's connected to race, it's African Americans. And this is the degree to which slavery really is transformed by the American colonial experience. Now slavery existed in cultures for centuries upon centuries upon centuries. But it's right here in America with chattel slavery that we see it in, in many ways, it's most brutal form, a form that again is connected with family and with race. And I think this is an, a really important distinction because it, it, people are in conversations around this and they say, oh, well, it's always existed. We can look back in time. It becomes different because as you explained, it now becomes transferable by birth and that you can never break three. So what, when I like, you look at the word chattel um, and you look at it's, it's unchangeable. And that's the part that makes it unbelievably different and becomes unbelievably violent as well. But our country 
goes into this next phase, this phase of revolution, this phase of natural rights and all men are created equal. And these two themes seemed unbelievably diametrically opposed to each other. So how can we be founded on a document that talks about all men are created equal and then also at the same time allow and embed the slavery into our fabric? No, that, that's right, Craig. And let's 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 get to 1776. Let's get to the Declaration because, in many ways, the story from here all the way to the Civil War and even the Thirteenth Amendment, so the end of our story today, is this this these two things embedded in the American tradition from the founding: the institution and slavery of slavery entrenched very very deeply, especially in the Southern states, but not only in the Southern states to begin with, but entrenched there. Versus these words in the Declaration. Um, you know, the, the most famous words probably in the American, the entire American tradition. So as we get to the Declaration of Independence, one thing to note is that leading, in those decades leading up to the Declaration in the 1700s, American slavery expands. It expands as an institution. It becomes more deeply embedded in the economy and the culture of the South. And so just take Thomas Jefferson, the author of the Declaration of Independence, his Virginia. So think about Virginia in the 1700s. I have the numbers here. We see the number of enslaved people uh, growing from 7% of the population in Virginia in 1680 to 28% by 1700, and finally to a whopping 46%, nearly half of the population by 1750. And so that just gives you an idea, as we're getting to the American Revolution, the degree to which slavery comes to dominate the economy and the wealth of many white Southerners. And then when we get to the Declaration of Independence itself, it's 1776, Thomas Jefferson's the author, he himself, is a slave slaveholder. Um, and what he does, one interesting thing is he does write into the declaration, his initial, you know, one of his initial drafts, um, a condemnation of the international slave trade. And so Curry puts it on the in screen here, but it really, it speaks in very brutal ways about how immoral, how evil the, the Atlantic slave trade was and blames King George for bringing it to America. And so you see even here in 1776, there are divisions among even slave slaveholders in America between those who really, really vigorously defend both the international slave trade and the institution of slavery itself, and those, especially a lot of Virginians like Jefferson, like George Mason, who attack the international slave trade as a great moral evil. Now, this passage doesn't end up in the Declaration of Independence. The, the, uh, especially the South Carolina delegates to Congress forced Thomas Jefferson to believe it. I like that, Curry, That's, that, 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 I don't like it, but I mean, it's a good yeah. image to give you a sense of like, the, the deep South and these slaveholding voices were at that moment as we're putting together the declaration. So that those words end up and end, end up outside the declaration, but important words end up in there. And those are the most famous words that the famous words that we read all the time, we think about all the time, that we hold these truths self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so this again, this sets up this sets up this battle between the ideals embedded in our in, in our the very revolution the revolution itself the things that we look to as our first principles and the institution of slavery and people see this from the beginning think of prince hall mm -hmm. so who's prince hall 1777 he's a free african-american in boston massachusetts he's active in the african-american community there and what he does is he looks at the declaration it's six months after the declaration of independence and he says this declaration is inconsistent with the institution of slavery. And so what does he do? He petitions the Massachusetts legislature and he petitions the Massachusetts legislature saying that these African-Americans, he has seven African-Americans are free. They're free because slavery is an institution, violates natural law, and it violates the principles of the Declaration of Independence. And what's amazing is that this petition, drive, it actually works. It works, we do actually, Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Supreme Court by 1783 agrees with Hall and says that slavery violates natural law, the Declaration of Independence and the Massachusetts Constitution and ends slavery in Massachusetts. And so we can see all the way at the beginning, the declaration being used by anti-slavery voices to advance the cause of abolition. And we will see this consistently in decades and the decades and decades to come, which we'll get into uh, later in the talk. Yeah, and it's just a couple questions around this, and I can see it in the chat as well. Um, this, when I read all the letters and the notes, and like look at Dickinson around this time period, even look at Madison around this time period, leading into the Constitution, it felt like there was almost some hope that they were all saying, "Okay, this is wrong. We have to figure out a way to 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 move ourselves away from an economy that is based on enslaved people's labor." 
um, and move ourselves to a different area. So when we look at how slavery is embedded, it's embedded into the economy, it's embedded into the culture. And then we look and see where is it written into the constitution in some fashion or not. But what, just so we're clear, they knew it was wrong. How, how do we get to this point where they know it's wrong, they're saying it's wrong, and yet they're still doing it? Is it because it is such a, it's such a key factor in the growth of the country as well? And does the cotton gin play anything into this? Like trying to kind of understand the whole system. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think the answer at the founding is that there are divisions among slaveholders. And so you have a certain subset of slaveholders. Uh, you're right, like Madison, George Mason, who are, know the institution is bad, it's bad for African Americans. They would say it's bad for the slaveholders themselves and it's bad for the future of America. And I think there's even this assumption that over time, maybe, you know, maybe we can bend, we can, we can bend the institution and bend away from it over time. And so there's at least some thought that that might end up happening. And this is precisely why when Abraham Lincoln is getting ready to run for president right before the Civil War, he goes back to the Constitutional Convention and he makes the argument that fundamentally, even many of the slaveholding voices in the founding generation were fundamentally anti-slavery. But there's also plenty of people, especially those from the deep South who were slaveholders, who would argue that no, slavery needs to be protected as an institution and that it's actually, there's nothing wrong with it. So you do see divisions there, even at the, the founding generation. Um, but no, over time, you know, part of it is, it just becomes embedded in the economy, in the wealth and interest of so many different people that well, you have, especially in the founding generation, some people who are both slaveholders and critics of slavery, or at least know that it's wrong. Over time, you see the, the arguments, even in the South and even in the upper South in places like Virginia change, where people would, it's so, it becomes so embedded as we get into the 1800s that not only, not, they no longer just argue that they're chagrined and we're just stuck in this system, but actually argue that it's an affirmative good for all the people involved. So we'll talk about that shift in a while. But Yeah, and that's the part that always blows my mind. It's not like we're, we get more enlightened or more, it's almost like we were, had a peak and then it drops down and gets worse. So let's dive into the constitution. So the constitutional convention comes and their key on the floor is debates around enslavement around um, representation and enslaved people being a part of that count for representation. And we have this you know, battle between putting slavery into the document and no property in man. So can you kind of walk us through the different parts of the constitution where we don't see the word slavery used, but we see references to enslavement? Yeah, so that's right, Corey. And I think that the bottom line here, the two things to really see at the convention is one, the framers really worked hard to not explicitly recognize the right to property and man in the constitution. So slavery, the word doesn't end up in the constitution and they, they really don't wanna have a clear endorsement of the institution. But these compromises we're gonna talk about in a second do provide key protections to slaveholders. And so they, they, there was a sense that even, you know, some Northern voices who didn't particularly like slavery were willing to strike a compromise with slaveholders to basically get a new constitution and a new government and a union together. So they were willing to compromise. And so let's walk through them. So the first one here, in many ways, arguably the most important is the three-fifths clause. So what's going on here? So remember, for the U, the, 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 let's back up. The Congress is, is divided into two houses of, of government. These, this is the legislature of the national government, the U.S. House of Representatives, and the U.S. Senate. So the U.S. House of Representatives ends up dividing districts between the states based on population. So if your state has a higher population, you get more districts, you get more seats in the House of Representatives. And as we know, the more seats your state has, or in this case, the more seats that a particular region, whether the North or the South, free states or slave holding states get in the US House of Representatives, the more political power they get. And so we see a big battle between slave holding voices in the convention and some anti-slavery voices in the convention about how are we gonna count enslaved people for purposes of the population that counts for how many seats a particular state gets in Congress. And so you see the pro-slavery voices saying, no, 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 we should count enslaved people as five-fifths. We should count enslaved people as a full person. We should get a full person bump for every enslaved person that we hold. We're not gonna give them rights. We're obviously not gonna give them the right to vote. Yeah, and I, and very I think poorly. that's, that's but, 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 but we'll let them count as people for purposes of us getting power in Congress. And then the anti-slavery voices, as you'd expect, said, this is crazy. This is crazy. How can you possibly say that you can count enslaved people for a full person for purposes of how many seats you're getting in Congress, but also say that you can hold them as property? And there's a great quote here from uh, anti-slavery voice from New York, the delegate Governor Morris, 
So he calls slavery a nefarious institution, the curse of heaven on the states where it prevailed. And this is what he says, attacking the three-fifths clause. He says that the three-fifths clause gives the inhabitant of Georgia and South Carolina who goes to the coast of Africa and in defiance of the most sacred laws of humanity tears away his fellow creatures from their dearest connections and dooms them to the most cruel bondages, more votes in a government instituted for the protection of the rights of mankind than the citizen of Pennsylvania who views with laudable horror so nefarious a practice. And so this is powerful language, gives you a sense, some of these debates could get really heated over slavery at the Constitutional Convention. In the end, the delegates broker a compromise. It's Roger Sherman of Connecticut who brokers many of these compromises says, you know, pro-slavery voices, it's not five-fifths. Anti-slavery voices, it's not zero-fifths. We'll go with three-fifths. And so we get the three-fifths compromise. Over time, it has a great practical effect though on American history because it ends up boosting slaveholding power in the US House of Representatives by counting enslaved people as three-fifths of a person, which in turn boosts their power in the Electoral College and their power over the presidency, which in turn boosts their power over the Supreme Court because those presidents then appoint Supreme Court justices. So the three-fifths clause doesn't mention slavery, but it does bend power in the direction of the slaveholding states. Yeah, and I think that's the part that feels like they want even more power by counting an enslaved person as one whole, but in no way does that imply they were giving any rights or any protections for that power um, that they were getting from this. And I, Tom, just to like reiterate as we go through, it gives more power to slaveholding states in all three branches of government. Start doing the math, students. Look at who's who becomes the president, who is what powers are in Congress, lawmaking body, and what power comes in the Supreme Court during the time period leading up to the 13th Amendment. Really does shift it. So going back to that first question, does this, cause a problem and make slavery last even longer in our country. Again, just going through the evidence. Okay, two more clauses. So the um, Fugitive Slave Clause and then the tr uh, Slave Trade Clause. They are in the Constitution from 1787. Yeah, the Fugitive Slave Clause gives slaveholders the power to go into non-slaveholding states and try to retrieve those who are accused of escaping slavery. And so this language, it comes from the Northwest Ordinance which was in many ways the product of Thomas Jefferson and his time in Congress. Thomas Jefferson tackled, tackled you know, in, 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 uh, in the 1780s, how are we gonna treat slavery in the territories? What the Northwest Ordinance says is that we're not gonna have slavery in the territories in the Northwest. What we will do is we will allow slaveholders to go into free territories to retrieve people accused of escaping slavery. And so in many ways, the, the, the founding generation, the delegates just write that into the constitution itself. Um, there isn't a lot of debate over this clause. Um, uh, and again, notice it doesn't mention the word slavery at all, but in the end it does give, a, this, this sets up a big conflict as, as we get into the 1800s between slaveholders and states that become increasingly free and increasingly hostile towards slavery. And, uh, and then finally, the, uh, oh, yeah, sorry. The, uh, finally, the slave trade clause, which is, which is the last one here. And this is all about the international slave trade. And so you have certain delegates at the convention, delegates like John Dickinson, George Mason, Rufus King, arguing that as we have a new constitution, now is the time to ban the international slave trade. We shouldn't have it in America. It's inhumane, it's immoral. We can disagree over the institution of slavery as it exists here, but we should all agree the international slave trade is wrong. But once again, the delegates and, and, and uh, many of the slaveholding states, especially from the deep South, like South Carolina, Georgia say, no, 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 no. We're not gonna enter any union. We're not going to approve of any constitution that takes away the international slave trade. And so once again, we see the delegates broker a compromise. They say Congress will initially have no power to ban the international slave trade, but Congress will get that power in 1808. It doesn't ban it at the, the, the constitution doesn't ban it at that moment, but Congress will have the power to ban the international slave trade in 1808. And Congress does, and Congress does. But again, it's another compromise where um, uh, it does protect the international slave trade for another 20 years. So as we're looking at this and we start to, you know, get depressed that we allow the kind of like all these compromises that we see as ways to, to put slavery into the constitution, what we have to see on the other, you know, at this whole package of American fight for freedom and equality, we start to look at even before the constitution through the declaration and then the power and energy around 
many people saying no. Governor Mar is saying it at the convention, who I, I love that piece that you shared from Governor Mars. Franklin saying it at the convention, Madison trying to rethink his enslave, enslaver, really trying to rethink it. But we have abolitionists and they're fighting from the beginning all across the country to say, nope, we need to fix this. We need to get this wrong out of this constitution. So walk us through how do we make change in this country um, even more? Sure, and I, I'll try to get through each of these figures as we walk through, but let's talk, yeah, let's talk about the 1800s, the lead up to the Civil War. The one thing to really note, and it, it strikes me the more and more I read about this, that this is absolutely true, and it's often lost, is that anti-slavery voices are there from the very beginning. We already talked about Prince Hall, but look at the first Congress. What happened in the first Congress? Benjamin Franklin, working with the Pennsylvania Abolition Society, puts an anti-slavery petition before that Congress. So this is at the very beginning. Franklin himself, uh, so the, the Pennsylvania Abolitionist Society, the first abolitionist society in America, it's formed by the Quakers. Uh, Franklin, after the Constitutional Convention, the, uh, Franklin becomes uh, its president late in life, turns away from slavery. And so here, what they do is they put a petition before Congress saying one, abolish slavery, but two, definitely abolish the international slave trade. And so what happens is this, this petition ends up before that US House, US Senate and the first Congress, and the Southern states are angry and a, and a huge debate ensues. And whereas the, U, the House and the Senate both put this petition aside, obviously don't act on it. They don't take any actions to abolish slavery. It puts those arguments squarely before the first Congress from the very beginning. <clears throat> and what we see throughout the 1800s are both pro-slavery and anti-slavery voices using the constitution uh, to make arguments about the, the, the institution of slavery and how it relates to America's founding principles. And so, you know, one thing to note is that there are slaveholding voices, people most famously like John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, who look at the history we just talked about at the convention, looks at the text of the constitution and says, of course the constitution's a pro-slavery document. Of course it is. You have all of these compromises with slavery, the three-fifths clause, fugitive slave clause. <clears throat> In the end, these things recognize as our right to have property and man, it doesn't say it explicitly, but it has to be implied from those compromises. Furthermore, we all know that we Southerners wouldn't have agreed to the Constitution if you didn't protect our right to slave to, to, to hold enslaved people. And so because of that, you do see aggressive, increasingly aggressive arguments from slaveholders throughout this period, arguing the Constitution's a pro-slavery document. But you see also from you know, the early 1800s onward, the growth of the anti-slavery and abolitionist movements. Now, these figures here, all of these figures are important to this story. And what, what, what's notable just at looking at these pictures themselves are that the anti-slavery movement the, and the abolitionists, it's, it's, a, it, it's, it's a, a, a movement of women and men, African-Americans and white Americans. So it's a movement where people across gender and across race find common cause. They find common cause often to try to advance uh, you know, the, the, their conception of equality and liberty, which they take to be the founding principles of America. And so on the, on the bookends here, you see Harriet Tubman, who's, uh, uh, you know, on, on my left, who's, you know, most famous for the Underground Railroad um, and, and, her, and her courage in bringing enslaved people up to freedom in the North. On the other side, on the, on the far right, you see Sojourner Truth, um, also someone who was much like Harriet Tubman, born into slavery, escapes slavery and becomes a powerful, powerful speaker on behalf of the abolitionist cause, but also, and, and this is true of Tubman too, for the women's rights and suffragist cause. So both of them would both fight for the end of slavery, but also for women's right to vote. Um, and as we sort of go then across the middle there, we see Harriet Beecher Stowe, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, which in the 1850s greatly increased uh, sympathy for the anti-slavery cause among Northerners and greatly angry, angered the Southern voices. And then uh, next to her is John Brown, the very controversial abolitionist who um, uh, at Harper's Ferry attempted to seize the, uh, the, the arsenal of the national government and wanted to incite enslaved people to rebel against their slaveholders. He was captured, he was stopped and eventually executed. A very, very controversial figure, even in anti-slavery circles, but a great hero to many abolitionist voices uh, during the period, uh, but also greatly, greatly, greatly concerned white Southerners. The thought that you, know, you might have an outsider come down into Virginia, try to take the arms from the national arsenal and try to get enslaved people to rise up against white slaveholders 
this caused great alarm, and this was this was a meager uh, what a year a year before uh, the Civil War. So it, it's a it's a major final precipitating event before the Civil War. And then next to him, you see Angelina Grimke, who is an important uh, she's she's important because she's actually born in South Carolina. So she and her sister Sarah are both white Southerners who then spend most of their adult lives in the North. She was a, 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 an abolitionist writer. So she wrote an influential letter in William Lloyd Garrison's Liberator in the 1830s. And then there's, we'll get to Garrison in a moment. Uh, and then, um, you know, also gave a, 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 a speech in, in, in Philadelphia uh, that she gave before what wound up being a violent stone throwing crowd. But she's another one of these very powerful voices on behalf of the anti-slavery cause. But again, the, I think the bottom line point here, Curry, is what, the, what this movement brought together were people uh, men and women, African-American, white Americans, all joined in common cause to push for an end to slavery. And then over time, what you see is increased support for the movement. When you, you know, if you were, you know, in the early 1800s and an abolitionist, you could face great violence, great violence, both in the South and in the North. It took great courage to advance those particular views, but they, come, they become increasingly popular over time. And I'll sort of, I'll pause there before getting yeah, to the rest of this history. I, the energy just becomes more and more and what we see in these stories and I love that you said that is such courage um, and such unbelievably passionate speeches about what life is like and this is what makes these conversations so important is that you're absolutely hearing the horrors of enslavement and the changes but also these great leaders calling on these founding documents and saying no you promised in that declaration, equality and freedom. And in that constitution, it needs to support that. So they're calling for change in the constitution and amendments to the constitution. So that always leads me to kind of the greatest caller of all times, Frederick Douglass. Absolutely. And, and, and the thing to note, Curry, is you're absolutely right. You read these writings and it's striking how many people go back to the declaration. And really the argument ends up being, can't we live up to these ideals? America, you're not living up to these ideals. Let's do it now. On the constitution, we see divisions among abolitionist voices as to whether the constitution is a pro-slavery or anti-slavery document. Curry had put William Lloyd Garrison up there initially and he was a really, really important abolitionist voice. Um, and he said, he agreed with Calhoun and the slaveholders. He said, the constitution is a pro-slavery document. It's a covenant with death and an agreement with hell is what he said of the constitution. So he and his supporters burnt the constitution. They told people don't get involved with these corrupt political parties. The only way we're going to abolish slavery is moral reform, is for us to change our souls. And by the way, we need immediate emancipation. So he was a radical voice, but also thought the constitution was a pro-slavery document. Now, Frederick Douglass had an answer to this. Frederick Douglass himself began as a Garrisonian when he was convinced by constitutional writers like Lysander Spooner, another important abolitionist writer, that the Constitution actually, in the end, was a pro-liberty document. He referred to it as a glorious liberty document. And so what he said there is, look at the Constitution, just look at it. Don't, don't try to go back to history and try to read all sorts of secret intentions, secret pro-slavery intentions into the Constitution. Look at the text. The text says nothing about slavery. It says nothing at all. Furthermore, look at the rest of the text. Look at where it begins with the preamble. The preamble's glorious words speak of liberty, not slavery. They point in the direction of freedom, not oppression. So the very purpose of the document laid out in the preamble, of course, bangs in the direction of abolition. But he also looks at other things. He looks at the three-fifths compromise that we talked about at the beginning. And he looks at it, he turns it on its head and says, you know what this does? It opens the door for people to recognize enslaved people as human beings. So it doesn't go all the way to full freedom and full recognition, but it gives some recognition to enslaved people. And then finally, he looks at the Fifth Amendment and its due process clause, its protection of life, liberty, and property without due process of law, and says, what violates due process more than the institution of slavery? So the due process clause points in the direction of protecting enslaved people, not slaveholders. He has this great quote here where he's discussing the preamble. I want to read it for you. He says, its language is we the people not we the white people, not even we the citizens, not we the privileged class, not we the high, not we the low, but we the people. If the South has made the constitution bend to the purposes of slavery, let the North now make that instrument bend to the cause of freedom and justice. Unbelievable. I mean, the, the words are so powerful. The hearing it is so unbelievably powerful. 
Um, when we think about this and we, we and we're wrapping up pretty quickly to the 13th Amendment, I, I move on to Lincoln. Was Lincoln always for a 13th Amendment? Was were these his ideas in the beginning or did he have to be swayed and moved in that direction by people like Douglas? Yeah, so Abraham Lincoln often, you know, for, for much of, of, of his political career, it, when it came to slavery, he supported what was called gradual emancipation and also compensated emancipation. So he was for setting a day, you know, sort of having uh, emancipation come somewhat later and for compensating former slaveholders for abolition. And so we pushed for this over time. But no, I mean, Lincoln, to his great credit, and Eric Foner speaks powerfully, the historian uh, of this in his, his book, The Fiery Trial, about Lincoln's views of, of, of slavery and many other things, um, that Lincoln had the capacity to, one, listen to good arguments from people who disagreed with him. So people like Frederick Douglass who were pushing him to do more and respond to events on the ground. And so Lincoln always believed that, that slavery was a moral wrong, always believed the national government had the power to exclude uh, slavery in the territories. And so this is that slogan of the Republican party and its predecessors of freedom national, slavery local. So the idea that the national government could use its power to get rid of slavery in places that it controls. Um, but Lincoln himself would evolve on this issue. And so let, should, we, should we go from sort of Lincoln, maybe maybe a, one quick beat on, Fred, on uh, Dred Scott, then Lincoln, then the 13th Amendment, Perfect. and that's it? Yeah, because the students okay. do have to jump. So let's do the Scots real quick, and then we'll look at the 13th Amendment. Perfect. Oh, okay, so, so the Dred Scott decision is in many ways the most famous, uh, infamous, important decision about slavery by the Supreme Court. Dred and Harriet Scott were enslaved people. They were brought onto free soil. By the, by the slaveholder. Um, and then what they did le with, with Harriet Scott leading the way is they petitioned for their freedom. So they had two young daughters. They didn't want them to be part of the, the system of slavery. And so they argued that because they were brought onto free soil, uh, they were entitled to freedom. And so they bring this, this action. It ends up before the Supreme Court and a decision by Chief Justice Roger Brooke Taney, just Chief Justice Taney rejects Dred and Harriet Scott's uh, arguments. And what he says are, are really three important things. One, African-Americans are not United States citizens. Mm -hmm. Two, African-Americans have, quote, no rights, which the white man is bound to respect. And that three, Congress doesn't even have the power to exclude slavery from the territories. And so three huge things, two of them uh, shutting freedom suits by folks like Harriet and Dred Scott. And the last thing about congressional power, basically declaring the political platform of the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln, the anti-slavery party, unconstitutional. Which brings us then, you know, the, the war came, the Civil War happens. Many things happen during the Civil War that point us in the direction of freedom. You know, so we have African-Americans laying claim to freedom themselves, escaping from plantations in the South, coming to Union lines, aiding the Union Army, many of them enlisting as Union soldiers. And so to this extent, many African-Americans laying claim to the promise of freedom and equality themselves, willing to sacrifice their lives, willing to shed their blood for their own freedom, equality, and for the cause of the union. This had a huge impact. We see during the Civil War Congress saying, we don't care what Dred Scott said, we're gonna abolish slavery in Washington, DC and in the territories. So an initial push to freedom. And then finally, and most famously, Abraham Lincoln with the Emancipation Proclamation, issuing the Emancipation Proclamation and freeing enslaved people using his war powers of president as president to free enslaved people in the Confederacy. Now this didn't end up touching enslaved people in the border states that were loyal to the Union, states like Maryland and Kentucky. Um, but it was a massive change from what happened before the Civil War. And so we see, even during the Civil War itself, these actions taken by President Lincoln, by Congress, by African Americans themselves to begin the hasten the end of slavery. And then finally, after the Civil War, we get to the 13th Amendment. So the 13th Amendment, the most important thing to remember here is that it made possible what seemed absolutely impossible, impossible before the Civil War immediate uncompensated emancipation. So enslaved people are freed, slaveholders are not, uh, are not compensated. And so it's this massive change to the American constitution. Um, and the other thing that's important there is that in section two, it also gives Congress then the power to enforce the promises written in the section one of the 13th amendment. Now, why did we need this amendment? Well, President Lincoln explained it pretty clearly. He really thought the only way we could really end slavery nationwide in a constitutional way was an amendment. Sure, he could do the Emancipation Proclamation during the war. Of course, it didn't touch all enslaved people. Furthermore, he worried that what was gonna be the future of the Emancipation Proclamation 
when we were no longer at war, if that's, those are the powers he's using to free and enslave people. And so he said, the only way we can put this on firm constitutional footing is through writing it into the constitution. He ends up leading the battle after his reelection in 1864 to see Congress approve of this amendment. And then even once Congress does approve it after a lot of lobbying by President Lincoln, even though he had no formal role in the amendment process, he signs his name to the bottom of the paper with the amendment, calling it a king's cure for the evil of slavery before sending it to the states for ratification. He wouldn't live to see the ratification of the 13th amendment, but it would be ratified later that year in December, 1865. The final point, Curry, and this is the transition to next week, because we're gonna to get to a lot of, we're gonna to get to the rest of reconstruction there, is that we then see after the 13th amendment, some abolitionists like, with, like William Lloyd Garrison, saying that, you know, my work in many ways is done. I think he says my vocation as an abolitionist is over. He said that the 13th Amendment turned the Constitution from a covenant with death to a covenant with life. But then there were others like Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts who looked at this and said, this was an important first step, but we have much, 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 much more work to do to ensure the equal rights for all Americans. And I love that you end on Sumner because I know you love him, but also because it's such an empowerful voice to understand and know. And I think one of the big ideas that we see in this class and will continue next week when we look at 13th, 14th, and 15th is that we have these amazing documents like the Declaration, like the Constitution, like these amendments, but it takes the work and the action and the fight of people like the Scots to make them a reality their energy, their work, their passion, their drive to protect their children is what makes the 13th Amendment happen as a part of all this work, of the work of all these people. So we look at the documents and what they promise and we ensure them through the actions and the, the push of the people. And so now I'm just gonna hold that on to that idea forever. When we look at any document, it takes the people to make it real. So thank you, Tom, this was a great class. Thank you, Kurt. <laughs> Thank you, students, very, very much. Great class, great chat as well. I'm going to stop all the recordings now.